I feel nervous saying this on the internet, um, but here we go. When Beyonce's Crazy in Love came out, there were some people who thought she didn't write it. For the record, Beyonce, I, I know you wrote it. I believe you. In this activity, we're going to be looking at the lyrics of the song to try to figure out if it's reasonable to accuse her of not writing it. Now, different writers have different writing styles and tend to use words that are about the same length. Like, imagine looking at the script of Moira Rose. Be careful, John. Lest you suffer vertigo from the dizzying heights of your moral ground. Compared to David Rose. David, I cannot show you everything. Okay, well, can you show me one thing? Moira's average word length is going to be much larger than David's. So what we're going to be doing in this activity is looking at the average word length of the songs in Crazy in Love. Now, there aren't that many words in this song. I think it's like 300 some. Let's just say we don't have time to find the actual mean length of words. Instead of finding the mean length of all 300 words, we only have time to take five of those words. We want to make sure those five represent the song well. So we're going to pick five words two different ways. Well, you're going to. This Desmos activity is going to walk you through the two different ways of selecting five words. After you select the five words, you're going to calculate the average length of the words. And you do that by just adding up the total number of letters in all five words and dividing by five. In a moment, I'm going to have you pause the video and do the activity. Pay attention to the directions because there's a part in the directions that says, go back to the video. And then we'll, we'll reconvene and we'll analyze the results together. All right, so pause the video. I'll see you in a couple slides. Okay, welcome back. Um, when you do this activity, your data might look different. Uh, if you have a different teacher that's running this activity, you might have some different dot plots here. These two dot plots are based on 18 of my Facebook friends who were kind enough to do this statistics activity in mid-July so that I would be able to make this video. So, thanks guys. Okay, so we can notice a couple things right away. First of all, let's look at the spread of the distributions. You can see that the spread of the student chosen words compared to the spread of the random words is larger. Okay, we have a bigger spread or more variability here. You can also see that the centers are different. The center of the student chosen words is somewhere around five letters, and the center of the random words is somewhere around three. This illustrates how bad humans are at being random. So when I ask people to really quickly pick five words that they think represent the lyrics, they're going to pick crazy in love, and then they're going to pick looking, and then they're going to pick some other five or six letter word. Because humans are bad at being random. When you actually select words randomly, you're going to get a lot of ins, thes, us, mys. You're going to get a lot of one and two and three letter words. The human brain looks at those and thinks, that doesn't represent this song. The word crazy represents this song. Which is why I'm willing to bet if you are doing this activity in your class, your dot plots might look different, but your dot plot for the student chosen words is probably shifted up from the random words. Because humans just, we aren't random. Like we just, we can't be random. We even use the word random incorrectly. Like, oh my God, that was so random. No, it wasn't. You saw someone you haven't seen in a while at the grocery store. That's not random. Okay, at this point, pause the video, do the next couple slides. When you get to the end, come back to this video and we'll recap the rest together. In slide 10, you saw the actual mean length of the words in Crazy in Love. The center of this distribution is nowhere near 3.53. It's not perfectly centered at 3.53, but it is much better than the student chosen words. Choosing your own words is an example of a convenience sample. A convenience sample is when you just pick people to be in your study or things, in this case words, to be in your study that are convenient. For example, if I wanted to get student opinion on some school policy and I just asked the 25 kids in my class, that would be a convenience sample because it's very easy for me to just ask the 25 students who are closest to me. But as you can imagine, that might lead to some bias. The 25 students in my class might all be seniors, or they might all be band kids, or they might all be AP kids. A convenience sample rarely represents an entire population, and we can see that here. This convenience sample really doesn't represent the true population mean. Our random samples definitely were better. Now somehow we know that for songs Beyonce actually wrote, her average word length is 3.64 letters per word, which is pretty darn close to 3.53. Personally, I would say that's probably good enough evidence that she wrote Crazy in Love. In future units, we will learn how to 
do a test to see if we have good enough evidence to prove that she wrote the song. I know it's frustrating, but for right now, this unit, we're just looking at sampling methods and how you design experiments, so we're not going to get into that at the moment. For right now, I was just curious, do you think she wrote the song? And in case you're curious, my 18 Facebook friends, um, mostly we believe Beyonce. There are some doubters, but mostly we believe. So to end this video, let's just look at some vocab that's going to be really crucial as we design experiments and get people to be in studies. There's two different types of studies that we're going to be dealing with observational studies and experiments. An observational study is just when you collect data based on what's seen and heard versus an experiment, which is where you're imposing some kind of treatment on your participants and observing their responses. For example, standing in the lunchroom and marking how many people get pizza versus how many people get a build your own sub would be an observational study. You're not doing anything to anyone, you're just observing who does what. In an experiment, you actually have to be imposing some kind of treatment. So to stick with the cafeteria theme, you have two classes, and in one class, the teacher does a bunch of examples about pizza. And then both classes go to lunch, and then you see if the class with the pizza examples is more likely to get pizza at lunch. That's not a very well-designed experiment, but there's, there's a treatment. Half of the people are getting the pizza examples, and half of the people are not, and then you're observing their responses after. It is important to note, uh, you can't conclude any cause and effect relationships if what you're looking at is just an observational study. Now, this gets a little tricky when you deal with humans because sometimes you can't impose a treatment on humans safely. And it also gets tricky when the data you have available is only from observational studies. An observational study isn't useless, you can still find a strong association between two variables and that can be very useful. You just can't say this variable causes this variable. We're going to talk about this a lot more in this unit, like what's reasonable to do in an experiment, especially when you're dealing with humans, um, and what's reasonable to conclude from an observational study. Now in any study, whether it's an experiment or an observational study, you're going to have a population and a sample. So in purple here I have the definitions. A population is your entire group of interest, and the sample is a subset of that population. So for example, the population could be all students at your school, and your sample could be a random selection of those students. Your population could be all the students in your class, like your math class. And then your sample could be just the students who sit with you at your table. Population could be all the citizens in your town, and your sample could be just one citizen um, from one house on each block. Population, all the seniors at your school. Sample, just the first 20 that come to lunch. Population, all the basil plants on your deck. Sample, every other basil plant. There's different ways of selecting a sample, um, some good, some bad, and we'll look at that in the next video. But if your population is large, you need a sample in order to represent your population, because you might not have time to ask, like, every citizen in your town. Depending on where you live, that might be impossible. So quite often we need a sample to represent the population just because logistically it's impossible to talk to the entire population. Now, if your population is all 30 kids in your class, well, that's, that's probably reasonable. In the Beyoncé example, our population was all of the words in Crazy in Love, all 300-some words, and we took a sample of five. Now, technology exists. I probably could have just put all those words into a spreadsheet, found the length of them, and easily found the true mean, but I wanted to use this as an example so that you could see what a sample and population is. Just a couple more kind of general things to note before we get into the details of picking a sample. So first of all, data collection that doesn't rely on chance can lead to untrustworthy conclusions. Now the example I used earlier was, I want to get the opinion of all students at my school, so I just talked to the 30 kids in my classroom. There was no randomness or chance in the way I selected those people, so the conclusions I draw about the entire school are probably not going to be accurate. They might represent all 150 of my students, or they might represent all AP statistics students, but they don't represent the entire school because I didn't choose them randomly from the entire school. And then along the same lines, a sample is only generalize, generalizable. Generalizable. A sample can only be generalized to the population from which it was selected. So if I have a list of all AP students at my school and I randomly select 10, any conclusions I make from that sample can only be applied to the AP students at my school, not all students or the five words you randomly selected from Crazy in Love, we can generalize conclusions from that sample to all words in Crazy in Love, but not 
all words that Beyonce has ever written or the population of words in all songs that came out the year Crazy in Love came out. What year did Crazy in Love come out? Oh my god, it came out in 2003. Oh my god. <laughs> so some of this video might have felt like it was just kind of some random facts about observational studies and experiments. We're going to go more in depth on both of those in the next couple of videos. The next video we're going to focus on how do you select people to be in your sample, and then we'll focus on once you have people in your sample, how do you design your experiment to reduce bias. This unit won't have as much calculation, it's going to have a lot more explaining, um, and you're going to have to be really creative to think about what possible bias might exist in an experiment or in a study. In conclusion, Beyonce's the best. Um, 